Hello folks and welcome to this last minute revision on volcanoes. Uh, so today we're going to try and go through as quick as we can the topic of volcanoes on the Leave Insert course. Uh, so the video today is not designed to be an in-depth look at volcanoes, but it's going to be more of an outline of the different aspects within that. So we're not going to go into detail on, we'd say, the formation of any particular feature, but we are going to look at the different features and just give it an outline of it. Um, so if you're looking for essays and stuff, we have other videos on that. But this is really a revision, night for an exam, or maybe if there's a topic that you're struggling with, give a quick run through and just refresh yourself. Um, so we get straight into it here, if I can get my pen working correctly. Uh, we're going to go straight into the different parts of a volcano. So oftentimes you're going to be asked to identify the different parts of a volcano and in doing so you might be given a blank diagram like this and then along the side here you're going to have to fill in the words or they might ask you to draw your diagram and label certain aspects of it. The main things really you're going to have to remember are the crater. So your crater is always going to be the big opening here at the top of the volcano and that is where any of the material that's inside the volcano are going to come out. Your ash, steam and or gas, that's going to be this stuff up here. Uh, that does tend to be the thing that most people are going to know about on volcanoes, the ash, steam and the gas. Very rare that they do ask for it. Volcanic bombs then, so that's the one that a lot of kids like to remember. Uh, it's basically where they throw out igneous rocks. So pumice is probably the main rock that gets thrown out, basalt as well. Um, but they're literally hot rocks that get thrown out and they're like bonds because they land to the ground they'll melt what's around them. Next thing then you're going to look at you're going to have the main vent so like it says on the tin it is the main channel tunnel vent as they call it that comes up through the volcano from the magma chamber and that's going to carry most of the magma up through the volcano. Um, you are going to have other bits as well on the side so you're going to have a secondary vent as well so these can come out here on the side so they're smaller vents that will carry less magma through and the amount of lava that's going to leak out on the sides will be a lot less. Now you can get eruptions on those sides as well but just a little less common. Uh, the cone itself then, so the, the main volcanic cone is obviously you know, the volcano itself which can also get secondary cones here on the sides as well and again they come from a buildup of this lava leaking out on the sides. It's almost like forming mini volcanoes on the sides of that. Um, after that, then we've got the lava, which is what's going to trickle down the sides of the volcano. The magma, which is the lava when it's inside the volcano, and the magma chamber itself, which is down here underneath the ground, and that's where your pressure builds up that eventually causes your eruption. So they're just really some of the main parts that we're quickly going to go through. It's important that you know them that you can identify them on the diagram and that you can draw them as well. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at then is the actual types of lava. So there's two types of lava that you can get. Uh, basic lava and acid or acidic lava. Um, i just change my pen colour here real quickly to match up. So your basic lava, I'm not going to get this right, uh, your basic lava is very runny. So I like to think of it almost like not as runny as water but it's more on that side of it and the reason it's quite runny is because the gases are expanding and they're able to escape and so this gives it a much runnier texture and when you have basic lava your eruptions are going to be much more gentle so i like to think of it as if you've got a water balloon and you pop a water balloon it's going to be messy but it's not really going to hurt you you know yeah you're going to get wet but it's not that bad. Whereas with your acidic lava, while it's going to be less hot, so it's about 800 degrees Celsius, somewhere about that, it's it's pasty. So it's thicker kind of a lava. And because of this, it's difficult for the gases to escape. And as a result then of that, it's very violent. So the eruptions are quite violent because you've got all the pressure of the gases building up inside the lava. They're not able to escape and so they're 
basically erupting within the, within the lava and that causes the eruptions to be far more violent than if they were basic lava. And then as a result of that you get different features which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Just to very quickly talk about the type of material that gets erupted from a volcano because you get, get asked a question to name a couple of things that get erupted from a volcano. So obviously the main thing that you're going to have is lava. You're going to get the volcanic ash. Uh, I'm going to put in gases there as well because you're going to get different kinds of gases coming out. So things like water vapor, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide. Uh, pumice, as I said. Uh, so these are like light color rocks. They're going to have tiny little cavities. And they are formed by the gases that expand within the lava. So they get thrown out as well. Um, as part of that, you can get volcanic bombs. So they can be your pumice or as well as that, they can be your basalt and it's where the rock gets exploded outwards during those eruptions. You can get cinders, um, you know in fires you have cinders and ashes or stuff like that. So cinders are just small like small hot lava fragments, they're only about a centimetre maybe in diameter. And in all that, all of this we call it pyroclastic material. So when you take all of them together, you can call them pyroclastic materials. So if you see that word coming up at any stage, that's what it means. It means a mixture or a combination of some or all of these. So that's what comes out of a volcano most often. We need to look then at the formation of our different volcanoes. And you'll see here there's three different occasions that your volcano can form. Now at junior cycle level, we probably need to really look at where plates separate because it's the more straightforward one and you never get asked one. Whereas that senior cycle, you do need to be a bit more aware of the other ones and you may need to explain the different types of them. So the first one I'm going to just quickly look at is here where the plates separate. So I'm going to call this one here number one. So where the plates are separating, it creates a space and the magma erupts or rises up through that space, flows out onto the surface. And then as a result of that, it's going to cool and hard when it comes into contact with the air and water or cools and solidifies. If you want to up your vocabulary a little bit more, use some of your geoliteracy. And over time, that will build up to form your volcanoes. The second one we look at is a hot spot. So this is one I'm going to put as number two. And what's happening in here is the magma is going to melt its way up through the crust. So what you have is a really super heated section of magma underneath the crust and it starts melting its way up through and just like the first one then once it does get to the surface it spreads out and it cools it solidifies and it starts building up to form what we call a hot spot volcano one of the most um, famous chains of volcanoes or volcanic islands if you want to call them that is Hawaii and so what's happening in Hawaii is first you get your volcano forming and then the plate starts moving along so in this example here, this would have been the first volcano formed. It would have been here. The plates moved it along. Then the second volcano formed. The volcano or the plate moved it along. You got a third volcano, and now it's onto its fourth volcano. And as the volcanoes move away, they become extinct because they no longer have a magma chamber underneath it, because it was a hotspot volcano. So once they move away from the hotspot, they're not active anymore. And over time, what's going to happen is the fourth volcano that's going to move down along this line as well and eventually you'll have number five six seven and so on now it can take thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of years for this process to happen but it does happen slowly but surely and so that is one of the things that sets um, hotspot volcanoes out from where plates separate for example because eventually they will have to go extinct because they move away from the hotspot the third kind of one that you're probably going to be familiar with but i'm just going to go back over it where two plates collide you get the heavier plate, usually the oceanic plate, that gets subducted down into the mantle and it gets melted. And as it gets melted, it becomes superheated and it rises up to the surface. Melts its way through the crust, just like with the hot spot, and it can form a volcanic mountain range. Or here we're going to call it a subduction volcano. So it's where the plate has melted, has melted down to become magma, and that magma rises up as a superheated magma breaks its way up to the surface and remember at convergent plate boundaries you get four mountains forming so the magma bursts its way up through those fold mountains and turns them not all of them turns some of them into 
volcanoes. Now it can also um, form a new one itself if it comes in contact just with the air it'll start building up but more often than not it turns a whole mountain into a volcano. So there are going to be our different types of volcanoes. Um, moving on then as well there's another type of eruption that can form different features. It's what we call a fissure eruption. So if you just see here on the image that I have have found for us there's a picture of a house it's a bit, right, there's a house here just normal road and then all of this area here is a big fissure so a fissure is a big crack in the crust um, and they tend to occur where lava flows out of a crack in the ground they can be tens of kilometers in length hundreds of kilometers in length um, and they develop as plates get pulled apart by tension and they can cause cracks so let's just say you've got um, a divergent plate boundary and so these two plates are separating as this they separate here it can cause pressure and tension throughout the rest of the plates and it can cause just simple little cracks to form in other parts of the plates and eventually those cracks can make it all the way down to the magma chamber and that's where you get lava leaking out onto the surface end so the magma moves up and then obviously we know as it comes to the surface it becomes lava and it leaks out Generally from fissure eruptions it tends to be basic or the, that runny lava that emerges and it spreads out really quickly and it covers large areas of the landscape and it can fill in hollows or valleys as it spreads out. Um, sometimes the flows can be up to about 50 meters thick and they can spread anything up to about 50 kilometers from the first eruption. And just to bring it back to a little bit in Ireland, from a fissure eruption you usually get a lava plateau um, and in Ireland we have the Antrim Derry Plateau that was formed about 65 million years ago and I will talk about that in a few minutes time. But that's just another type of um, lava flow that can happen. I think look at this as you've come through during your cycle you know the stages of a volcano, you have your active volcano, when the volcano is actively erupting and it has erupted the last 10,000 years and is likely to erupt again. Your dormant volcano is one that has erupted in the last 10,000 years, unlikely to erupt to get, or <clears throat> that hasn't erupted in the last 10,000 years, and but is still likely to erupt again. So it hasn't erupted in a long time, but there is a, still a good chance that it will. And then your extinct volcano is not going to erupt again. So active volcano can erupt at any time. A dormant volcano hasn't erupted in a long time, but it could still erupt and most likely will erupt again. And your extinct volcano is just not going to erupt again. I think it's well visualized here where in the magma chamber of an active volcano tends to be full. And what's happening is you constantly have pressure forming or pressure occurring in here. And that's what causes the eruptions. In the dormant, dormant volcano, the pressure is less. And so while there's still pressure building up, it's much less. And as a result of that, the eruptions tend to be less frequent or less common. Whereas in the extinct volcano here, the magma chamber, there's no pressure building up. Possibly because if it was on a hot spot, it's moved away and it no longer has that fresh supply of magma coming up. And so as a result of that, you're not going to have any more eruptions. Just want to quickly have a look at the Pacific Ring of Fire. So you're going to be asked, I'm sure, about different um, examples of Volcanoes, so the Pacific Ring of Fire is where most of the world's volcanoes happen. I get 70% of the world's volcanoes and earthquakes occur in this Pacific Ring of Fire, which you can see in red on our map. It goes all the way around the uh, the, uh, the Pacific Ocean. It looks like a little bit of a horseshoe. Some of the most common volcanoes in this Ring of Fire that you're going to be talking about, Mount St. Helens, that's always a very popular one for books to look at. Mauna Loa, that's another one that they're going to talk about a lot as well. Uh, Krakatoa, I'm sure some of you will have heard of Krakatoa on this side. Um, and beyond that as well, I mean, look, you can see yourself, there's so many of them around. Don't try and learn too many volcanoes. I think it's always good to maybe pick one that occurs where plates either separate or collide and then pick one at a hotspot because you could be asked to describe, describe the, any of them. And I think you just need to cover yourself. So Mount St. Helens and Mauna Loa, they're probably the two that I would recommend you pick. Uh, Mauna Loa is obviously in the Hawaiian Islands, and so it is over a height. It's a hotspot volcano. Uh, Mount St. Helens then in the mountains in North America. Um, now, look, beyond that, you, your book 
or your teacher may have picked any of them. The A of Elio Cull in Iceland is a really good one. It's local to Ireland, or not local to Ireland, but it's closer to Ireland than any of the others. It's a recent eruption as well, and there was a lot of impacts, and it's probably the one that you did at junior cycle anyway. So that all impacts on it. Um, I just want to have a look through the different types of volcanoes because, yeah, we have different, or we have volcanoes forming at different plate boundaries, but within that, we also have different types of volcanoes. So I'm just going to talk really quickly about them because, again, it's a good to know or to have an understanding of the type of volcano that has formed. So the first one, I'm going to go from right to left here again. The first one I'm going to look at here is uh, a composite volcano. So composite volcanoes made up of several different layers which stem from different eruptions. So it's not a volcano that has formed within a single eruption. And it usually has steep slopes um, in the upper area. So you can see here the, the slopes are quite steep. But then it gets a little bit gentler in the lower areas. Uh, we say Mount Etna and Mount Fuji, they're all types of composite volcanoes. And so what happened, what's happened is different eruptions have happened. So you'd have had one eruption here, and then maybe this was your second eruption. And what happened is over time, the volcano erodes down a little bit, so the older eruptions tend to flatten out, or perhaps they were um, a different type. And then you get your new eruption, and it creates a new peak. And so it will have a different kind of a shape all the way up along, almost, I won't say like a Christmas tree, but you know, you can see the next one might be a little bit more steep again, and so on up along, and on you go. The next one that I'm going to look at, I'm going to jump now to the left-hand side. Sorry, that's just the order that, that my notes are in here. You have a shield volcano. So a shield volcano, is, it's literally going to have the shape of a shield. It's not going to be completely flat, but it is going to be just slightly rounded. Um, it's very gentle slopes. It's made up of your basic lava, so it's going to be quite runny. And that's why it spreads out over a large area, because as we said earlier on, the basic lava can spread... Uh, can spread out quite quickly because it's running and so it moves quicker but then it can cool and that's why that's what gives it a sort of a, almost a flat uh, a flat shape or a flat profile you can also get a dome volcano so this is this one here a dome volcano i'm going to do that one as number three it is very steep um sometimes it's higher than it is sometimes the height is more than the width now i know this this uh this this graphic here isn't great but it was the best one that i could find uh, it's formed from very viscous lava and so it solidifies really really quickly around the vent and so because of that what you get is it doesn't travel very far so it might only travel this far and i know the the that that's the way the thing is so it might so it tends to be a much higher shape but of course as eruptions happen you can get higher and higher shapes as you go on uh, but the thing to remember with the dome volcano is it's going to be much taller than it is wide um, and then obviously to erosion it can be broke down uh, the last thing I just want to talk about quickly is a caldera so a caldera is where is this this basically this opening here where you have an old volcano so this would have been your old volcano there's your crater up here and basically what's happened is they had such a powerful explosion that the top of the volcano blew off and you're left with this big opening in the middle of it and then obviously the new volcanoes will start to fall um the rocks on the outside here the basalt rocks they'll start collapsing inwards and you just get this big opening in the side of of the volcano so they're the different types of volcanoes again um you probably will be asked for them more so in an essay format than in a short question so it is good to know and understand the different types there's four of them your composite volcano is made up of a load of different eruptions. A shield volcano is going to look like a shield. Dome is taller than it is wide, and a caldera is where the top has been blown off of your volcano. Looking then at some of the internal features. So if you want, you can say that the, these cones up here, these different volcanic cones, they're external features. If you want to look at the internal features, um, we've got a couple of them here, not, not too many. I'm trying to, to keep it straightforward enough. Um, Sometimes the magma won't reach the surface, so it'll come into the chamber, the magma chamber, but it, it won't reach the surface, it leaks out into the rocks around it. And so it can form a number of structures. Now, we call these structures, they're plutons. Um, hopefully you can see that colour, it should be fine. 
So they only get revealed when erosion happens and the rocks around them get moved away and they become uncovered. So the overlying rocks are eroded away and they become uncovered then. So they vary greatly in size, in shape, and how the magma itself makes space for itself. So, for example, you can see sills here. They are horizontal flows of magma that have moved in between the layers of the rock, whereas a dike, for example, is a vertical one. So the magma has worked its way up through the layers and has cooled that way, whereas sill is when it goes horizontally. So that's what I mean when I talk about the shape and the way the magma has uh, moved its way through the crust. So generally what happens is the magma pushes its way up through the crust and, and forces its way into the bedding planes of sedimentary rocks and this forces the layers to bulge and, this is, and when it happens horizontally you get your sill and then you have the pressure of it pushing upwards here filling in the spaces then and that's how you get your dikes. Uh, so sills are horizontal sheets of magma. They were basically, I suppose think of it as being injected between layers of sedimentary rocks. Uh, they do form relatively close to the surface, so if you see here, they're they're much higher up than a lot of the other features. Um, there's less pressure here from the overlying rocks, and that's why magma is able to fill its way in. So if you think down here, for example, in these layers, there's a lot of pressure being pushed on from the rocks above, so it's much harder for magma to make its way through. Whereas here in the upper layers, there's a lot less pressure from the overlying rocks, and so as a result of that, magma can make its way through dikes then they're the vertical sheets of magma they get injected into the fractures that exist between the layers of the rocks they cut across the different layers and what happens here is the magma puts the pressure in through the rocks and it starts widening the fractures further and that's how the dikes will build up over time uh, the other one i want to talk about to you is the battlets so the battlets they're the largest of the plutons and sometimes can cover about 100 kilometers squared really huge areas they're deeply buried the magma cools really slowly because obviously it's surrounded by very hot rocks um, and they are formed of very coarse grained coarse grained granite um, and the Irish example we're going to look at in a bit will be the Leinster Batalith. Uh, I just very quickly then want to look at some of those Irish features of those rocks so the first one here I have is the Antrim Derry Plateau so as I talked about um, earlier on the Antrim Derry Plateau is a lava is a lava plateau of basalt rock so the Antrim Derry Plateau covers I'm going to change the color of my mark because I won't be able to see that it covers about 4,000 square kilometers it's a really huge area so this would have formed about 65 million years ago um, and it was a result of fissure activity so fissure leaked out and that's how we got our plateau um, so what was happening at that time is the European and the American plates were splitting apart and as it occurred the crust was stretched and those cracks started forming because of the pressure in the centre of the plates. Lava then poured out and it formed a fairly flat featureless landscape. So you can see here there's really not much features going on. Obviously you have the Giants Causeway that happened and that's, um, that's a separate thing. Our, it's part of the lava plateau, but it's going to be a separate example, if that makes more sense. For now, I just want to talk about the Antrim Derry Plateau. I probably should write it in. So, so the individual flow itself, they cool, they formed um, basalt rock, which is an igneous rock. Um, and then in the process, the original chalk covered landscape was covered over. So the landscape was actually already covered in chalk and then it got covered over by the lava flow. And then as the place drifted apart, we got slightly new volcanic activity and it added more elements to it. Um, Giant's Cause, as I said, has 60,000 basalt columns. It's the most distinctive part of it. Um, but when I'm talking about explaining it, and when you go to do it in an essay, you get asked for an extrusive volcanic landform. We're going to talk about the Antrim Derry Plateau, not the Giant's Causeway. Now, you can bring it in, into it, but the main thing I talk about is how the Antrim Derry Plateau formed. The second one I want to talk about, I'm sorry, this, this is the best uh, the best that I could get on it, the Leinster Batholet. So, this one here is your Leinster Batholet. Why am I putting in a highlighter? It's not going to be good for anybody. I will put a pick of better colour. So, this is your Leinster Batholet 
this area here. So this red section here is your Leinster Battle. It's the largest pathway battlet in either Ireland or in the UK. And it runs from Killiney in Dublin, which is somewhere about here, to Thomastown, down in County Kilkenny, somewhere somewhere around there. I'm not going to be exact on it. It occupies about 1,500 squared kilometres of landscape under the Dublin Mountains, the Wicklow Mountains, and the Black Stairs Mountains. It consists of five separate domes. So within this, you've got bulges. So the magma, as it puts, pressure, as it puts upward pressure on the land, the land above it's going to start to bulge. And so there's five separate bulges throughout the Leinster Battle. Um, so when it came into the contact with the surrounding rock, the intensity it actually caused it to form into metamorphic rock. So while the battle itself is granite, the rock around it is quartzite and schist because the heat and pressure that it came under from the magma in the battle. Um, now, weathering and erosion over the last uh, yeah, about 400 million years, because it was during the Caledonian period that this happening, has started to expose some of the dome shapes. And so you now have dome shaped mountain, and such as um, Table Mountain, that's a good example to have. And Lugnaquila, I hope I got that right, um, it's about 925 metres, it's the highest peak in the Wicklow Mountains. And that has capped with schist, which, as again, we say was metamorphosized from the granite rock. And all of that comes from the Leinster Battle. So look, that was just a really quick look through the chapter on volcanoes. I really just give a very quick outline. Again, it's one of those things, just to try and refresh your memory the night before an exam, or maybe you just had a topic and you didn't quite understand bits and you just want to try and piece it together. As I said, there's not much in there that would make an essay for you, but as I said, we do have other videos to help you with essays. My thing is always learn the facts, not the essays. So what I've tried to give you here today are some of the facts. And if you learn anything at all, then I think we've had a fairly successful one. Uh, so thank you very much for watching and I hope you tune in again.